Well, hi, everyone. It certainly has been a busy week in the aftermath of the key bridge collapse. On May 13th, the Unified Command used explosives to blow off a large section of bridge truss from the bow of the dolly. This is in preparation of refloating the dolly, perhaps as soon as the next few days. Also on May 14th, we saw the NTSB release their preliminary report on the key bridge collapse. The final report's probably a year, year and a half away. And I don't think it's quite fair to call this preliminary report a nothing burger, but in essence, it just has some bare bone facts, some sequence of events, and doesn't get into other aspects that will be important later on in the final report. So these NTSB reports ultimately have to address what happened, why it happened, and include recommendations as to what could be done in the future to prevent a similar disaster. So for this video, I want to get into some of the key facts. I want to present what the key narratives seem to be coming out of this even preliminary report and what likely is going to mean for the final report on this disaster. And also, there's a uh, rather surprising error that NTSB made in this report, so I'll get to that here in a bit. But I've done a number of videos about this key bridge collapse, including the first video I did on the day of the collapse, where I pointed out that the pier protection, these dolphins that exist well upstream and downstream of the two piers supporting the main span of the bridge or supported the main span of the bridge were wholly inadequate. And NTSB in their preliminary report addresses some factual information, but they don't get into the design implications or whether these dolphins should have been bigger or positioned differently. They, they clearly should have been, but I'll get into those details as well. And then finally for this video, I'm going to tell you what I think NTSB either will or should include for recommendations in their final report. Now, in this preliminary report by the NTSB, they list uh, who they refer to as party participants. Now, these are people that are key to the investigation, and they're not allowed to disclose any investigation information once they've signed that party agreement with the NTSB. That doesn't mean that they can't release information that was in their files prior to the collapse. A lot of these parties to an investigation say, oh, well, we signed a party agreement. We can't provide any information. We saw this with Boeing not wanting to release time cards of uh, Spirit staffers to Congress. And NTSB made it very clear that they are allowed to do that. The party agreement doesn't preclude that. So. I'll get into that more in a future video because I have some direct experience related to this episode as to at least one of these parties not wanting to provide any information, whether they're misinformed about the obligations of the party agreement or it's just an excuse not to provide information uh, publicly that they consider sensitive or perhaps embarrassing. Now I'm going to read some of this here. This is, uh, came out of the NTSB preliminary report where they classify this collapse of the key bridge as a major maritime casualty. And by definition, that includes one or more of the following. The loss of six or more lives. Yes, six people lost their lives here. The loss of a mechanically propelled vessel of 100 or more gross tons. Well, that certainly has been met. Property damage initially estimated to be $500,000 or more. Well, that's happened. And a serious threat as determined by the Commandant of the Coast Guard with the concurrence of the National Transportation Safety Board Chair to live property or the environment by hazardous materials. Well, we also know there are a lot of hazardous materials in uh, cargo units on this Dolly ship. Now, in their preliminary report, NTSB goes over a sequence of key events you have the primary electrical breaker that feeds most of the dolly's equipment and lighting trips. The ship loses electrical power and has a blackout. Secondly, a main propulsion diesel engine shuts down automatically after pumps lost electrical power. The vessel loses main propulsion. In other words, its propeller stops. The crew restores electrical power to the vessel. They call for tug assistance. Senior pilot orders the anchor to be dropped. 
a second blackout occurs. There's a radio call made to warn everybody in the area of a impending collision between the dolly and the key bridge, and then the dolly hits the key bridge. So some of the details in this report, we learned that there was a senior pilot and an apprentice pilot on board the dolly when this crash occurred. There were a total of 21 crew members, 20 from India, one from Sri Lanka, and the dolly was escorted out of port by two 5,000 horsepower tugboats. Now here's some shots from the NTSB report of the engine room for the dolly, and they describe this engine as a single slow speed 55,000 horsepower diesel engine manufactured by Hyundai. The engine was directly connected to a single right turning propeller. To run the main engine, one of the vessel's four diesel generators must be operating and supplying the vessel with electrical power. The emergency generator alone cannot be used to restart or run the main engine. The dolly's main engine required compressed air directed into its cylinders to start and change directions, to change from a head moving forward or to a stern. They go on to say that the ship's electrical power is supplied by four AC generators, each driven by a diesel engine. So that's it in broad strokes. Now, the NTSB goes into the fact that there were two episodes of power outage on the dolly before it left port. It's indicated on March 25th, this was the day before, about 10 hours before leaving Baltimore, the dolly experienced a blackout during import maintenance. While working on the diesel engine exhaust scrubber system for the diesel engine driving the only online generator, generator number two, a crew member mistakenly closed the inline engine exhaust damper. So crew member made a mistake. They only had one generator, which you only need one to run the, the main engine, and they made a mistake and basically the engine just stopped. They restored power. It ran for a short period of time and then a second blackout occurred. While recovering from the second blackout, the crew switched the bus configuration basically the breakers on the buses. They say the first import blackout was caused by the mechanical blocking of the online generator's exhaust gas stack, and the second blackout was related to insufficient fuel pressure for the online generator. So why is this important? It shows that they had electrical power problems before the dolly left port, and these problems reoccurred, which resulted in the dolly impacting the key bridge and taking it out. Now there's another important aspect to this narrative and I'm gonna to get to here in just a second. And that has to do with, I think, trying to recover much more money from those involved than what would be limited under current maritime law, a law that goes back to the 1850s. And that is the FBI has opened a criminal probe, as I've reported previously and, and others as well, into the whole episode leading to that power outage and then collision with the key bridge. Now, it would seem, just from my perspective, that these were accidental issues, but does it rise to the level of negligence? Is, is this something that happens fairly routinely with other ships? Was the Dolly crew inordinately cavalier about having electrical problems and proceeded on anyway. I think for now they should get the benefit of the doubt. We'll let the FBI and NTSB complete their investigation. But it does seem that both the FBI and even the NTSB in their report have laid the groundwork for others to come in and say, hey, the limitations of liability under maritime law don't apply if you're criminally negligent. And whether they can make that case or not remains to be seen. But to me, that seems to be a strong er undercurrent to all this investigation. So then next, they get into some generalities of the Key Bridge. It was open to traffic March 23rd, 1977. So it made it just a little over 47 years before it collapsed. The bridge is over the Patapsco River. Overall length of the bridge is 9,087 feet. And the main span is a continuous steel through truss, which we know is vulnerable to collapse if it's compromised, which is exactly what happened. Next, the NTSB gets into the fact that this bridge had a satisfactory condition rating. So in other words, a perfectly serviceable bridge, which could have had many more years of useful life, was taken out by this collision with the Dolly cargo ship. Then towards the end of the report, they finally get into the aspects of the bridge pier protection system, which consisted of four dolphins. They are only 25 feet in diameter. I mean, puny. 
I guess they were trying to protect against an errant bass boat. I don't know. But I can just tell you there's another part of this narrative is that, hey, this bridge was completed nearly 50 years ago and design standards have changed and ships have gotten much bigger. Well, there were very large ships back in the mid 70s going underneath these bridges. And places like the Port Authority of New York saw fit to retrofit a bridge that was built in 1928 with much better pier protection than what existed at the Key Bridge. They used 45 foot diameter cellular coffer dams all around the bridge piers. And later, one of these was taken out in 1979 and they replaced it with an even larger diameter uh, cellular coffer dam at 60 feet. So other people have seen fit to retrofit their bridges to provide more adequate pier protection. Even though the bridge was built well before many people were thinking about such requirements and just were acting from an engineering standpoint and a risk management standpoint. You know, what makes the most sense? These peer protection systems can be put in for a hundred to two hundred million dollars. The Delaware River Port Authority is undertaking an extensive program to upgrade the peer protection at a number of their bridges. But from the NTSP report and other news reports, we know that the Dolly never impacted any of the dolphins at the main bridge piers. So the report points out the configuration of these dolphins. They were basically concrete-filled cellular coffer dams, again, 25-foot diameter, and there's a fendering system around the pier itself, which doesn't provide much impact protection at all. It's really more or less, you know, this whole system they have here is, in essence, a navigational aid. It doesn't really provide much of any protection to the bridge, as, as unfortunately we saw. So I'm going to get into what the NTSP report concludes in terms of what they're going to continue to look at. And I'm going to tell you what I think is going to be in the final report in terms of recommendations for pre preventing future disasters like this. So we see here the NTSP will continue evaluating the design and operation of the Dolly's power distribution system. Okay. The NTSB is working with parties to immediately assess their bridges and determine whether peer protection needs to be improved. You think? You know, I did a video about how the Bay Bridge is vulnerable to this exact type of impact from a large ship. I did that well over a month ago. So it's pretty obvious that not only the Bay Bridge, but many others need to have a hard look, a strong assessment of the risks associated with passing ships relative to damage or failure of the bridge itself resulting from an impact. So specifically, Maryland Transportation Authority is studying short-term and long-term options for the upgrades to existing peer protection system for the east and westbound lanes of the Governor William Preston Lane Jr. Memorial Bridge, which again, commonly referred to as the Bay Bridge near Annapolis, Maryland. Now this is what really kind of stuck in my craw here. The NTSB is examining the peer protection improvements that have been made on the following bridge collapses resulting from marine vessel strikes that the NTSB has investigated. The Sunshine Skyway Bridge in Tampa Bay, Florida. Again, I've done videos talking about what they did after that bridge was taken out in 1980. Pretty reasonable island and dolphin protection systems. Then they say the Queen Elizabeth Causeway Bridge. Well, that's the error I was referring to earlier. It's the Queen Isabella Causeway Bridge that was taken out in 2001 by a barge hitting the bridge pier. And in that instance, the captain of the ship, the captain of the tug, indicated that he really just kind of got complacent. He'd been through that underpass of the bridge many times and, uh, just was going too fast and not paying enough attention. And that collapse resulted in several deaths. And then the I-40 bridge near Weber's Fall, Oklahoma. Again, I've covered that in a previous video. So bridge damage and collapse from vessel strikes is nothing new. They are rare occurrences, but there has to be a rational risk assessment done and protections need to be provided accordingly, I think. As a result of these bridge incidents, 
The American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, AASHTO, issued their guidance on providing peer protection relative to impacts from marine traffic on bridges. And it turns out that they kind of gave themselves a pass because keep in mind, these are bridge officials among all the states in the United States. Federal highways can't tell them directly what to do. These are the states deciding on their own what they're gonna do. And they basically said, yeah, going forward, we're gonna do this rigorous risk assessment. And if necessary, these bridges need to have peer protection put in at the time of construction. And they gave themselves a pass on providing any type of protection for existing bridges. And clearly that was a mistake, I think. They updated these standards in 2009. And again, as far as what NTSB is gonna to continue to do before they issue their final report on the key bridge collapse, they're gonna conduct interviews, including with bridge experts, waterways management personnel, marine safety and highway regulators, and vessel operators. Well, that seems like a reasonable thing to do. I don't know why it takes subsequent disasters for this to happen. There's been plenty of marine disasters with bridges in the past 40 years alone that should have necessitated readily available recommendations and guidance from the NTSB. But again, we're gonna have to wait for the final report on that. I'm gonna put a link to a playlist in the description. Sometimes if people are watching these videos on TV, these cards, you know, I'll maybe point and say here's here's a, a link to a video or a playlist those cards don't appear on youtube tv as, as far as i've seen so i'm going to put the link in the description but i've got videos addressing several things about the key bridge what the likely replacement is going to be i said early on it's going to be a cable stay bridge in all likelihood and now that's what's being reported as the likely case i've talked about how the peer protection was wholly inadequate for the key bridge we're right out of the gate the first day of this collapse. Uh, NTSB's tiptoeing around that right now. I, I don't know why they couldn't have made a more forthright statement about it. You know, I understand and appreciate that the NTSB has to be very thorough in the way they investigate things. But again, if there's very obvious lessons and guidance that can be made, get it out there. Don't wait another year, year and a half to do it. So more news to come on this story. I'm also working on several stories in parallel, and I've got some that are really nitty gritty geotechnical engineering disasters related to some DOT projects that I think you'll find extremely interesting. So I cover a variety of engineering topics, but my specialty is geotechnical engineering. So I would appreciate your ongoing comments, feedback, I want to send a shout out to the channel members. I really appreciate your ongoing support. Also want to send a shout out to those of you who have provided super thanks. That's another way to support the channel. So again, stay tuned, everyone. I've got a lot more content coming out and thanks for watching.